We're, we're really uh, delighted to have with us this evening the, the British uh, historian and novelist uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore. Uh, his new book, The Romanovs, is, is quite an epic, a uh, sweeping look at, at 300 years of Russian history, uh, chronicling the Romanov dynasty uh, from its faltering start in, in 1613 with the 17 year old Michael to the downfall of the hapless uh, Nicholas II in 1917 and the slaughter of 18 members of the imperial family. Uh, it's quite in character, uh, given his previous works, for Simon to have undertaken such an ambitious story. Uh, after all, as he's shown with his two prize-winning biographies of Stalin, his best-selling Jerusalem, and his book on uh, Catherine the Great and, and Potemkin, uh, he does not do small bore history. Uh, this latest expansive work is filled with, with violence, palace conspiracies, family rivalries, sexual decadence, and cycles of repression and revolt. Uh, indeed, if you are a fan of Game of Thrones, you'll love reading about the Romanovs. Um, actually, I'm now wondering about the propriety of talking about the Romanovs here in this Quaker meeting house. <laughs> Well, maybe you can just give the uh, edited, G-rated version of the story and, uh, and leave the rest to, for everyone to read about it in the book. Anyway, as his previous works, um, as in his previous works, uh, Simon has shown again his gift for bringing to life the outsized personalities of Russia's past. Reviewers of the Romanovs have praised both Simon's eye for detail and his fluent, captivating prose. And certainly for anyone trying to uh, place Putin's autocratic rule in context and better understand Russia's ongoing struggles between modernist and traditionalist tendencies, it helps to appreciate more fully what transpired under the Romanovs. So uh, please join me in welcoming Simon Sinai Montefiore. Thank you so much for um, coming. Thank you for that introduction. Um, lovely to be here um, in this rather austere and extremely unrolled Romanov Hall. <laughs> um, it's hard to imagine anything less extravagant than a Quaker Hall. <laughs> but anyway, I'll try and um, embellish it with the jewels of, of um, Romanov corruption and de debauchery for you. Um, so, um, and uh, and it's lovely to be here in Washington, and I even have some family here, so it's, which is very nice. So, um, I just thought what I would just do is give you a quick introduction to, you know, how and why um, I wrote this book, and then we can just discuss anything that, um, that anyone wants to discuss, or we'll just sign books. Um, the first thing to say is that the, the essence of, of, of my book is really um, in the first kind of few lines of it, which is, you know, Russia is an extremely hard country to rule, and to be a czar is an extremely difficult thing. Uh, Russia is not only enormous, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religion, um, it has no natural borders, um, it's, it's a place that is so colossal that even the greatest czars and the most terrifying tyrants in its history have struggled to be obeyed there. Um, Peter the Great, in virtually the last thing he wrote, wrote to his governor general of Moscow, you know, come up here, I'll punch you in the face unless you do exactly what I say, and if you don't hurry up and turn up, you'll lose your head. Stalin, in his retirement, sitting uh, by the Black Sea in his dacha, used to talk about nothing but the fact that even though he'd killed millions of people and um, taken Berlin, and made Russia a nuclear superpower. Still, he sent an order to Minsk or Alma Ata, and no one obeyed and bothered to answer. And Putin, if you watch telly, um, Russian television at the moment, you'll see him virtually every week he's sitting there at that T-shaped desk, telling off some minister for not doing what he's told. So Russia is a very hard country to rule, and to be a czar is a very hard thing. Um, uh, I mean, if you look, at the history of the Romanovs, for example, out of the last 12 czars, six were murdered, which is quite a high percentage. In Russia, we might come to, the, we'll come to some of those deaths in a minute, but in Russia, um, 
In Russia, you know, it's impossible to really be paranoid. We often talk about Stalin or Peter the Great or President Putin even being paranoid. But actually, it's very hard to be paranoid. Paranoid suggests a delusion of danger. But in fact, um, most Russian rulers exist in constant fear and vigilance. And extreme vigilance backed by violence is the only way to survive in a system without rules. When we look at it from the outside, we look at those rules and we think they're paranoid, they use violence, they're frightening, um, and they can rule do the hell they like, you know, as, as autocrats. Uh, but of course, because there's no because there are no rules in their system. But look at it the other way around, and that's what I do in my books. I look at the power from the inside, or try to. And if you look at it from the inside, to exist in, in, the, in that position, in a place without rules, there's no legitimate, real way to overthrow you. The only way is by violence. And the Emperor Domitian, one of the worst of the Roman emperors, um, made only one joke in his life that we, that we know of, and that is he said, you know, it's very hard to be an emperor because no one believes that people are plotting to assassinate you until they do assassinate you. <laughs> and, um, and that's, of course, very true with the Romanov dynasty, as you'll see. And that is the great thing that they're trying to avoid. But though many of them, but though, of course, we, we know about the end of, the, of Nicholas and Alexandra, but overwhelmingly in Russian history, the, it, was, it was not popular disturbances that overthrew uh, czars. It was their family, their friends, their courtiers, their ministers, their cl the people who were absolutely around them every day. And of course, that is always on the mind of the Tsar in the Kremlin, um, even, even today. And that always has to be why, for example, President Putin has just created a huge um, Praetorian Guard of 400,000 men, a presidential guard. You could never be too safe in that situation. Never. And and of these deaths, I mean, let's start at the end, and we maybe we'll go back to the beginning. Nicholas and Alexandra, um, there is a story that we all know well. I have to say, writing, writing that account of the death of the Romanovs, the two, the two parents, of course, the four daughters who were only in their teens and early twenties, hardly been out, their mother had never let them go out into um, into society, they barely flirted with anybody. They flirted with, you know, the, the, the crew of the Imperial yacht, um, the, the Cossack convoy of um, the escort, and then in, in captivity, they really had the most exciting time of their lives in that way, at least, um, by flirting with the guards and often the communist guards. Many of them fell in love with them, and they flirted with them, and right to, towards the very end, even as the shadows were lengthening even as Lenin was giving orders that if there was any danger of them being liberated by the white counter-revolutionaries, they could be killed. And not just the parents, but all of them. Now, when the order came and um, to the to, to Yekaterinburg, to the Apatia House, nicknamed, uh, officially named the House of Special Purpose in a very sinister way, I think the parents probably already knew that they were, likely to be, they were likely to be killed. And I must say, Nicholas Alexandra, in captivity, acted with great dignity and grace, uh, which is one reason they've been made a saint by the Orthodox Church. But in other ways, there were hints of their, of their earlier life. Um, Nicholas read history books, and he read over and over again the biography of Emperor Paul, who had been assassinated by his courtiers. He also read to his daughters as they went to bed at night the protocols of the elders of Zion, the rabidly anti-Semitic forgery that, um, that, that his own secret police may have put together and compiled, but which he believed was absolutely true and which precisely reflected his view of the world. In other words, Nicholas and Alexandra were wonderful parents, perhaps, who were in love with each other. He was certainly probably the most faithful um, the most sexually continent of the whole dynasty. And yet, the image that we're used to, the Robert Massey image in, that, in those books that we love, uh, Nicholas Alexander, the movie, which I'm sure many of us have read, um, is, to me, is to me not quite a complete picture. And I think that this, the, the version you'll read in my book, is a more complete one, a less romantic one. 
a one that looks at Nicholas and Alexandra uh, as politicians, as political, as political, as political people, and, and, as, and, and not just as a married couple with a haemophiliac son. Now, when the order came to, to wake up the Romanov family, um, to take them downstairs, the death squad was already assembling in um, a downstairs room in the Apatia house, a house that had been boarded up, its windows whitewashed, um, and, and they'd been told, they were told that they were leaving at dawn, um, in, while it was still dark, to be taken away from the whites. In the last, the last week, they'd been able to hear the guns booming, the howitzers firing as, as battle got closer. And they must have hoped they would, they would survive, they would be moved, they would be rescued. But, as we know the story very well, about 1.30 in the morning they were woken up, they came down, they were shown into a cellar room. And whilst waiting there, Alexandra asked, who had aged enormously, asked for a chair to sit on, she was brought one. Alexei had recently recovered from a haemophiliac attack, his knees were still painful. He asked for a chair and he was given one. And Nicholas sort of stood protectively in front of him and waited. As they stood there, they may perhaps have looked like a family waiting for a family photograph. As they stood in the group, because there was also their servants, the four girls, Dr. Potkin, the family doctor, who stayed with them. Several members of the entourage had been arrested, taken away mysteriously, and shot in the woods, but no, none of them knew that. So all the time, their, kind of, their, their, their entourage had been sort of culled slowly. And now it was time. And Yurovsky, the commandant of the house, brought in 13 or 12 men. The numbers aren't quite certain. Somewhere between 11 and 13. A mixture of Russians, some Austro-Hungarian uh, prisoners, um, some Lets from Latvia. Um, and they came in, and all of them were heavily armed to the teeth with many guns, bayonets, rifles. Now beforehand, oh and some of them by the way were drunk, and some of them were sort of psychopathic criminals. One of them had beheaded someone during the bank robbery before the revolution. So they were, they were fanatically um, Bolshevik. Uh, uh, they hated the Romanovs. They were proud to do this duty for the revolution. And yet, none of them wanted to kill the girls, understandably. And they were each told to choose one member of the party and to shoot that person. And when they came in there, suddenly Yorovsky stepped forward and read a declaration that condemned the Romanovs to death for the intervention of their cousins, they said, meaning George, meaning George V, the English intervention in the revolution. And then when, when Nicholas said, well, what did you say? He read it out again and then said fire, and they all started to fire. But weirdly, um, or perhaps understandably, they didn't, they didn't fire at their targets. They, they pointed their guns at their targets. And when they began to fire, they all aimed at Nicholas and shot him. Because that was a much easier, that was a much easier target. And he fell to the floor bleeding from many wounds. Then there was 20 minutes of chaos. Now an execution should take one second. Um, this was probably one of the most bungled executions. Um, that you can imagine. And it was made much worse by one very strange thing. The girls, the children, were all wearing bulletproof vests. But you know what they were made of. Yeah. I know some of you will know. Yeah. Jewels. They were made of diamonds. And they'd spent the last few months sewing the Romanov diamonds into these um, specially made underwear so that they had um, they had uh, uh, money to pay for their passage if they escaped. Um, and so they, they, they had all these, they, they were wearing what was in effect um, the hardest substance known to man. So the bullets bounced off them. So no matter how much they fired at these poor screaming girls, um, they couldn't kill them, they could only hit them at their limbs. And, and in the end, um, the details the details are in the book, but in the end, the killing was a terrible, it was heartbreaking to read about it. Many records were left of it. After about half an hour, 20 minutes of this absolute mayhem, during which, by the way, the executioners managed to kind of shoot each other as well and burn each other and wound each other. They were all standing, shooting over each other's ears, and half of them were deafened. Um, 
After all of this, right, they carried out the girls. Two of them sort of woke up, started coughing and spluttering, and they had to be, they finally were killed. The next three days, it took them three days to actually dispose of the bodies. So bungled, so incompetent were they. They didn't sleep for three days as they went back and forth between the woods, various places in the woods, um, to try and um, dispose the bodies in such a way that no one would ever know what had happened. But rumours spread that perhaps one of the girls had survived, probably from the fact that as they were carrying them out, one, one, two of the girls woke up. And a lot of these guards were drinking and talking about this afterwards, and somehow that must be the origin of the Anastasia myth. She, no, one, no one, in fact, survived the execution. No one. Now, I mean, as I said, it was, you know, writing these books is, is an interesting experience. You, you, you write about wonderful things, you write about terrible things, you read things you shouldn't read, and you have to make decisions what to put in, into the book. And of course, you know, Initially, I wasn't going to put this in, I was going to end it with the fall of the dynasty, but in the end, I had to put this in. And to jump back 300 years, more than 300 years, I start the book with two boys. The first boy is the boy who was brought downstairs, as I just described, Alexei, in his teens, sickly with hemophilia, just recovering from an attack. And um, a boy who um, was born to be Tsar. His parents longed for him. So much of the distortions of their reign were really about preserving autocracy so this little boy, Alexei, could be Tsar. Not just Tsar by in, in name or Tsar in a, constitutional, in a constitutional Russia, but Tsar in the full plenitude and glory of autocrat. Now, he was born of hemophilia, so really he was unlikely. He was unlikely in those days that he would live beyond 20 or 30. And yet his parents devoted their entire reign to make, keeping the power for him and for him to enjoy. Even though there were plenty of other male heirs, in fact, in the Roman office, there were about 50 grand dukes. They also decided to keep, it, to keep the disease secret, which perhaps is understandable, though everyone knew he was ill. And in a sense, this distorted their whole reign. It put, put immense pressure on the child and on the parents. Um, it drove Alexandra almost mad. And I also, in a sense, um, gave the parents a mission. A mission that, was, that they believed was God's will. And that this child, this God-given child, despite his illness, must reign. Um, as I said, it was, it, was, it was, I think, a mistake. I think they should have admitted that he was ill, made a different heir. Maybe things would have been different. Maybe they would have been more flexible in their politics. But the child who came down <coughs> that day was the heir to this, to this great empire, which they lost. And 300, over 300 years earlier, 1613, another little boy, also sickly, also, un, also seemingly unsuited to the, for the rough job of the Tsar, um, was summoned in the middle of the night. Uh, at, his, at, at another place called Apatia, the Apatia Monastery. And he was, he was woken in the middle of the night and in Russia that was, again, rather like in 1918, a Russia that was literally a failed state that was falling apart. Just as in 1918, um, about 10 nations were invading Russia and, and civil war raged across the country. So in 1613, the Swedes were, were carving up Russia from the north, the Poles from the, Poles from the west, the Carters from the south, and many warlords and, and, and Cossacks and pretenders claiming to be all sorts of members of the royal family were fighting savagely. Even, even Moscow was occupied by the Poles. So it was a very similar situation to 1918. And, and, and in the middle of the night, the boy and his mother were woken up suddenly and told that, that a huge delegation was approaching who had come all the way from Moscow. They got up and they dressed in their best gear. And this boy had already, who had, had like epilepsy, already had a life of great stress. His father had been taken away from them and imprisoned in Poland, probably never to return. He'd been kept a prisoner by the Poles in the Kremlin at a time when the Kremlin was like a charnel house. And, um, and he'd escaped out to Kostroma, far from Moscow, to, to be safe. 
When rumours had started that was interest in him, interest that I will explain in a second, the Poles and Swedes sent death squads to hunt him down. So this was a boy with ticks, facial ticks and twitches, with a weak leg, pale, not particularly clever, not particularly articulate, a bit of a non-entity in fact, and a boy far too weak ever to be czar or hold any importance. But he was important because his great aunt Anastasia had been the favorite first wife of Ivan the Terrible and the mother of the three boys who were the heir to the, um, to the, to the, to the Tsardom of Muscovy. Now it wasn't their fault, it wasn't anyone's fault except Ivan the Terrible's that he murdered his eldest son in a fit of rage and therefore, just, therefore robbed the kingdom of the only fit heir to be Tsar. And that's what brought about the downfall of the old dynasty, the Rurikid dynasty. And after years of civil war, they finally looked for a meek and innocent lamb of a child who would offend nobody and who could be the new Tsar. And in an election of, a, of, a, of, a, of an assembly that contained not just noblemen but many ordinary Cossacks, they elected this child to be the next Tsar of Russia. Another totally unsuitable candidate, but like Alexei all those hundreds of years later. And of course, at this time, he knew nothing about this. But death squads were sent to find him. One peasant was actually arrested and tortured to, to, to tell his whereabouts, but died rather than give him up. And finally, the boy found out what all this was about. He was woken in the middle of the night. His mother was woken. They came down. They dressed in their beautiful boyars robes and furs. And they came down. And as they came out of the monastery where they'd been hiding, there in front of them was something like 300 of the most beautifully dressed the highest officials, the bishops, uh, the boyars, the, the, the noblemen, the military commanders, the top, the top soldiers, all of them were there. And when they saw this little boy who walked down with his limp, they fell to their knees before him. They prostrated themselves as, as they did, before, like, as if before a Byzantine emperor or a Genghisid Khan. And they fell down and they kissed his feet. And then they rose up. And they said, we have elected you, Tsar of Muscovy. Come to Moscow. Found the dynasty rulers. The boy burst into tears immediately. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> and his mother, in a somewhat sort of Monty Pythonish touch, started sort of lecturing them and shouting at them, saying, how dare you offer the throne to my boy? I mean, we've, we've had a peaceful life. It's not a safe job. We don't want your, we don't want your crown. We don't want your Tsar. Too many Tsars have been killed. Um, recently, there aren't even, then she said, and there aren't even any crown jewels left, they've all been stolen. So it's quite sort of, when you read her account of what she says, which we have a record of, uh, it, it, well, one, sort of, one can only imagine that she's sort of waving her fingers at them, and then they turned and went back inside. And they must have thought, what the hell do we do now? <laughs> and um, finally, after many, many attempts and arguments, um, they accepted the throne. And their cavalcade to Moscow, which took many days, was quite the most miserable procession to a coronation that, I, that I've, ever, I've ever heard of. Because no one, no one really wanted to accept this kind of this mixed blessing. But the opposite to Alexei in 1918, uh, Michael, for this was he, Michael Romanov, founded the Romanov dynasty. Um, in a few years, against all the odds, because the chances of him succeeding must have seemed pretty near to, to, to zero, um, he succeeded, his commanders succeeded in defeating all of the invaders one by one. And he succeeded, despite being, as I said, a grey person, a person who left few, um, few kind of colourful characteristics at a time full of colourful characters. Um, he was just simply very religious very meek um, and, and very respected. And the strange thing was, to be a Tsar was an impossible task. Not just a poison chalice, but a role that could really only be fulfilled by a genius. And many of the Tsars said that. To be an autocrat, you had to be a prime minister, a generalissimus, a field marshal, a, 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 a pope, a patriarch, um, a, 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 the head of a family. You had to be uh, the owner of an estate. You had to be a statesman. You had to be all of these things. And how many statesmen do we know 
none in our lifetime virtually, <laughs> who fulfilled all these things in a, in a brilliant fashion. And yet this was what was expected. The reason why there was, was never a Russian Bismarck or a Russian Metternich is because the autocrat had to rule himself. He could never allow anybody to be as important as a Bismarck. And this is one of the tragedies of the Russian state of autocracy, that increasingly the Tsars struggled to fulfill the role um, that they'd been tasked with. But Michael didn't do badly. In a long reign, he had a son, um, he, he married twice, and he founded this dynasty that was to rule for 322 years. Um, and the one of the interesting things about his reign was how they chose wives then. No Western royalty would marry the brutish czars of Muscovy. And they, no matter how much they tried to marry <coughs> the Western dynasties, no one would hear of it, even though Ivan the Terrible had wanted, dreamed, threatened to marry Queen Elizabeth of England. <laughs> um, and um, she, she certainly had a lucky escape there. Um, but, so instead, they married, Rus they married Russian girls. But to avoid upsetting the balance of power at court, they used something called a bride show, which was a cross between the X Factor and the voice in this world. You can imagine such a thing. 400 girls were summoned from the whole of Muscovy. So everyone put forward their daughters or sisters or whatever. And they were brought to Moscow, all of them, and lodged in, in one big house. A bit like the sort of Big Brother house or the MTV house or something. And they were all living there with all their kind of family. And, and there was a lot of primping going on and perfuming and dressing up. And the whole point was that these weren't daughters of great magnates. They were gentry good gentry families from the provinces. So they would not upset the balance of power court. But like all um, beauty contests or singing contests or whatever, of course it was sort of fixed, um, really, though not everyone knew that. So of the 400, they had to be examined by doctors and the court, head of the court and so on. So that whittled down a few. And then when they got down to about 30, um, they, they would then sort of start to really look at them closely. And they would find out, the whole point was, they would be looking to their backgrounds. The point of looking to their backgrounds to find out that they weren't well connected to anybody, which is unusual, you expect the opposite. But of course, the people looking in to check that they weren't connected to anybody also had an interest in finding if there was any connection between them <laughs> and finding a candidate. So, when it came down to the last five or ten, there was something called a viewing. And this was a key moment when the Tsar himself would walk in and he would give a handkerchief to the, to the ones he chose. And then, then there would be another viewing. And then there would be down to five. And he, then he would walk down all five of them. And, of course, all the top courtiers would already have cultivated these girls secretly. So, you couldn't completely fix the end result, right? Because at the end result, only the Tsar would choose. And no one could completely predict what he would do. But um, the idea was, if you had about, if there were ten and you had about three of your own candidates in that ten, obviously your chances were raised. So that's the way it was fixed. Now, the Tsar would then walk down, give his handkerchief, and this girl would immediately be given a new name. She'd become a Tsarevna even before the marriage. She'd move into a special house in the Kremlin. She'd be given new linen, new clothes. Her family would move in with her. And she would instantly become the most important girl in Russia, even before the marriage. But she was also in mortal danger. Because, because this, this whole system would normally um, offend one or other of the top magnates of court. They would do anything they could to stop this new family coming to, to power. And they used any methods they could. So uh, at least one, of, one was poisoned to death, which was very common, by the way. And another one, the first um, girl that Michael became engaged to, was given an emetic, a diuretic, and to her horror in front of the whole court, while standing there in all her beautiful robes. She started vomiting and all the rest. And of course, was totally humiliated. But worse than that, she was now in double danger. If she was ill, 
had she tricked the Tsar, had her family tricked the Tsar. So she was allowed to keep her linen, but she was packed off to Siberia with her, with her father and uncle. A terrible injustice that took over, it was about five years before the Tsar became confident enough, Michael, the unconfident, unwell, non-entity Michael, became confident enough to challenge what had happened to this poor girl. And it turned out, of course, that his mother was behind this. <laughs> and, and, and his mother and her, and her family had poisoned the girl. So it was a very rough thing, even if you won the contest of you know, the X Factor. Um, even if you had the X Factor, it didn't save you once you stepped outside that world. And in the end, he found out that she'd been poisoned. He brought her back, and she was given some, she was given some presents and a ha nice house, but she was sent back to her provincial town. Um, she was tainted after that. So very hard court, even before um, it became really vicious. Because after the first two Tsars, in 1682, uh, there, were two, there were two heirs left. One was, was Peter, Peter I, the child of Tsar Alexei's um, last marriage in his old age to the beautiful Natalia Nereshkina. <coughs> and he was such a vibrant child. He was already, even as a, even a little boy, a giant and he grew to six foot seven. But when he, when he succeeded to the throne as a little boy, after the death of his father uh, and uncle, and a half-brother, um, the Streltsy, who were the musketeers, the court guard, we were talking about Putin's court guard just now, um, the Streltsy rebelled, and Peter had what could only be described as a terrifying trauma that marked him forever, and gave him both a sense of how to use violence politically, but also of the danger, the security danger that I talked about at the beginning, the necessity to be vigilant at all times. For they rose up, they basically demand, they surrounded the, the palace, and they demanded these huge men in their fur hats and their red coats, all with pikes and swords, and they demanded the surrender of his uncles, who had to be given up to the crowd. They were tossed off the balcony onto the raised, the raised pikes in front of little Peter, the, his favourite minister, whose hand he was holding, was ripped from his hand and taken outside and also tossed in front of him. Afterwards, Peter, always for the rest of his life, had facial tics, um, epilepsy that may have started with this terrible trauma. And yet he grew up um, to be really the most brilliant of the family. I, I, I said at the beginning, you know, I said earlier that you had to be a kind of genius to be a Tsar. Well, Peter the Great had it all. He was half monster, half hero. He was brutally, brutally brilliant. He had that talent that few people have, which is to know what you want to do, which is half the battle in politics, is it not? But also to have the ability to make it happen, which is the other half. He was an extraordinary figure. As I said, six foot seven, twitching, um, when he was crossed, absolutely brutal. His dining societies, which he, which he, um, which he, which the whole government had to attend, were terrifying combinations of Stalin's nocturnal banquets and Led Zeppelin on tour in the 80s, in the 70s. Um, dwarfs were tossed, um, virgins and, and hookers jumped out of cakes. Um, dwarfs were dressed as old men. Giants were dressed as naked as babies. Um, uh, uh, many of the courtiers dressed up as deacons and bishops and patriarchs wore nothing but a, 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 a robe open and um, a, a mitre and, a, and, a, 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 and, and they carried dildos on, on cushions as they walked in. Um, the drinking was obligatory. Anyone who didn't fulfill any of the orders or jokes that Peter suggested had to drink the giant eagle goblet that was this big, full of cognac or vodka. Um, in various occasions, um, once two rivals, rough, one of the one rival rough, ruffled his political rival's hair, and the other one just grabbed a fork and stabbed him in the neck and killed him. Um, uh, on other occasions, two of these chief ministers died of alcohol poisoning. Peter said, I can't understand why I keep losing ministers to this terrible um, thing, you know, where he sort of forced them to drink. Um, and, and all the time, Peter himself would get into fights with people. He'd suddenly accuse people across the table of corruption, 
or of um, undermining or plotting against him to jump on him. He had to be pulled off. And he was this kind of incredibly strong giant. And yet, this is such an extraordinary character. Don't make a mistake to think that he's some kind of buffoon. Far from it. All of this had a role. Everything with Peter was both what he wanted to do, but also what he wanted for Russia. And everything served a political purpose. So that this, these kind of, this jolly company, as he called it, or the drunken synod, as he also called it, this institution was really a way to keep his henchmen absolutely under control, under his eyes, to keep them humiliated, and to signify, since he himself would not dress as Tsar, he appointed other people to be Tsar, he appointed other people to be Patriarch, he just pretended to be a bombardier, a sergeant, a junior officer, a captain of a ship, and he loved that. But what he was really signaling was the same thing that Potemkin later would signal when he just, when Catherine the Great would be receiving an ambassador, and Potemkin would just walk in one door, walk out another, wearing nothing but Turkish pantaloons and a bandana, chewing a, chewing a cap. In other words, these people were saying, we are God-given statesmen for Russia. Peter would say, you know, I am the God-given Tsar. I can change the kingdom any way I like, and you will obey me. So this was Peter. His real, I guess his real mission was to turn Russia, it was not so much to reform Russia and modernize it in a Western sense. And that's the mistake we always make with Russian reformers, is to imagine that they uh, wish to create a sort of liberal democracy when, they want, when, they, when they're able to reform. More usually, they want to make Russia efficient and to get Western military technology in order to take on the West. And that's what Peter the Great wanted. He wanted to make Russia more efficient, more able to take on the West, and, that, and, and he succeeded. He defeated the prime military power of, um, of Europe, Sweden. He uh, built a navy of ships of the line in the Baltic. He founded a new capital city, Petersburg, which was built on the, on the, on the bodies of thousands of um, hard laborers, a punishment that he invented in Russia, and which lasted right the way through into Soviet times, as you know, and still exists. And his successes were extraordinary, but he was also challenged constantly from inside. He was resisted. People plotted against him, conspired against him. He, mur he tortured to death two of his own uncles, his, wife, his first wife's uncles who were plotting against him. He always supervised torture himself, not just because he was a saint, so I think he was that too, but also because a clever czar, a clever ruler of Russia, takes care of security themselves. That's the one thing. That and the army are the two things that every Russian Tsar, every Russian autocrat, even in 2016, wants to handle himself. And then there's the case of his son, his son Alexei, who hated everything his father was doing, who hated his modernizations, who plotted against him, and who ran away to, um, to Vienna, hoping to avoid ever being Tsar, or possibly <coughs> to raise the army against um, Peter, come back and overthrow him. In his cups, he was also a drunk, the son, but without any political ability. And he, he plotted, probably, to overthrow and replace his father. When his father leered him back, he sent a special agent to trick the boy into returning. And that agent was Peter Tolstoy, the founder of the Tolstoy family, um, and, the, the, uh, and, and the, the, the relative of um, the, the novelist, of course. In fact, the book's full of Tolstoys, in fact. Um, there were many ministers who were Tolstoy, but this Tolstoy was as cunning as a fox. And um, Peter used to go up to him and say, and, and stroke his hair. Because Peter Tolstoy had originally been working with the Streltsy, who the, the, the um, guardsman who rose up against, against Peter, who killed all those people right in front of Peter. And he killed all of them, thousands of them, he tortured himself, but he forgave Peter Tolstoy, who became one of his closest henchmen. But he used to go up to him and he used to stroke his head. Peter Tolstoy was much older than him. He used to stroke his head and he used to go, this head wouldn't be on these shoulders if it wasn't so clever. <laughs> and that was just very sinister. So Peter Tolstoy always knew what he had to do. And he had to bring back this boy, Alexei. So he leered him back. And the moment he got back, he was tricked. He was arrested. All of his entourage were tortured. Peter himself tortured and beat him um, until the boy died. Um, even on the day that he died, after weeks of torture, and which, by the way, you know, is like, um, you know, with, with, with the strikes of this whip, um, the canout, you know, you could be kind of, you, you could be killed um, on the foot, you, you could break someone's neck, um, break someone's back 
if you knew what you were doing with one strike of it, or you could keep them alive for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, but in the end, the victims of it would die of sheer exhaustion, shock, infection. And Peter tortured the son, even on the day he was clearly dying, they tortured him again. Find out if there were any more traitors. Now, when you kill your heir, um, it creates a problem. Because then you have no one to leave the country to. And so, um, Peter ultimately left it to his wife, his second wife, Catherine I, who is not Catherine II, the great. Um, but Catherine I is one of the most extraordinary characters in the book. Because her rise was probably the most meteoric of, any, of anyone in modern European history. I mean, forget Napoleon. I mean, Napoleon was a, was a, was a, was a, was a, was a noble, Corsican nobleman, uh, educated in, with, with enlightened principles, um, you know, and, and, um, and this girl was actually born neither Russian nor Orthodox nor noble nor royal. She was Scandinavian, probably. And she first appears in the story naked, except for a blanket, walking into the Russian camp as a prisoner of war in the war against Sweden. She became the mistress of the, of, of, of the, command, the Russian commander, and he passed her on to Prince Menshikov, Peter the Great's best friend, and got a, she got a job as laundress to the at, at court. And she met Peter, and Peter fell in love with her, and he married her, and he had many children with her. Sometimes, some, some people reckon 12 or 13, many of them died, virtually all except three died. And, and then he made, gave her a new name, Catherine. Her real name was Martha. And he then crowned her Empress of Russia. Can you believe it? And not only that, but when, she, when he died in 1725, she succeeded him in her own right as Empress of Russia. And so here's somebody who, had, who wasn't even Russian, who had no connection whatsoever to the Romanov family. And she was a character, a rum character. She could outdrink Peter. She was so strong, um, she could handle everything. Their correspondence is both touching and slightly kind of, and, and, and slightly grim. He always, he always, whenever he had a son, he said, oh good, a new army recruit. And she was constantly writing to say, you know, I hope you haven't caught BD from all those prostitutes. Leave your mistress at home, I want to make another baby. So it was quite a sort of crude correspondence they had together. And yet quite homely as well. Very fond of each other they were. And yet, there were great crises at one point. Um, after she'd been crowned empress, Peter discovered a huge scandal that she may be sleeping with, a, with an extremely handsome German um, chamberlain at her court. And Peter, who could be terrified, of course, um, arrested the boy and, um, and tortured him to death and had him executed and sent the head to her in a bottle. So she had to put up with that. Um, and yet she, she did, she survived everything and succeeded him. Rome herself. And she was the first of a line of female, because Peter <coughs> basically murdered, um, murdered his own son, there was a shortage of heirs in the family. And as a result, the 18th century is known as the Petticoat Age because it was ruled overwhelmingly by women. And what an amazing group of women they were. Some were great, um, and some were really appallingly cruel and depraved. Um, some set a standard for statesmanship and humanity that still lasts to this day. Others would have been more, would have really belonged as a villainess in Game of Thrones. Um, so let me just see how long, ooh, oh my gosh. Well, um, well see, this is, we're having a good time. Okay, well we're not going to do that. I would just simply say, just cast a quick thought um, to Russia today, and just say, people often ask, um, is, is President Putin sort of channeling, is he, is he the new Tsar, is he the new Stalin? And the answer is that he's really a mixture of both. It would be simplistic to say he's, he's, he's actually the new Tsar or the new Stalin. That would just be simply naive, because every age different history really doesn't repeat itself, even as false. But um, he's certainly channeling, uh, he's certainly channeling the rules of the past. Uh, there are those he admires and those he doesn't admire. The point is that he's totally unideological. He doesn't regard communists as different from monarchs. He says, for example, um, Lenin's one of the most disastrous rulers 
um, of, of the Soviet Union, um, of Russia. But Stalin was one of the most successful. So, you see, this is got, you, to, to, he says, when he talks about traitors, the weakest and worst rulers of Russia, he, his two he names are always Gorbachev and Nicholas II. <laughs> see, do you see the way it's working? So that's interesting, isn't it? So let me just finish by going back to where I started and say um, that 1917 centenary is coming up. 1918 centenary is coming up. And Putin is thinking about this. And you may well already know that in 1998 they, they found and buried the bodies of the Tsar, Tsarina, and, and most of the children. What you may not realize is that two were missing. And those bodies were only found in 2007. They then spent the next almost 10 years in a box in the archives. And those were the bodies of Grand Duchess Maria, the third daughter, and of Alexei, the Tsarovich, who were buried separately. It's a long story, it's in the book, why they were up. But the whole point was that no one should ever find them or work out who they all were. But the church refused to bury them, and nothing was done with these bodies. I say bodies, they are fragments of skull. But last year, President Putin and the head of the, the, head of the church, the patriarch, who by the way in Russia is a sort of, it's sort of like, it's like a minister, the, the, the church has come on with the state. Um, and the head of the security uh, investigations uh, committee, which is, runs all the security organs, the secret police. These three institutions made a decision to test the bodies of all the Romanovs again, including the ones that have already been buried, Nicholas and Nicholas Alexandra, and the rest of the children, and, and, and also to test these two that have been discovered. And that's going on right now as we speak. And no one knows what's going to happen. I mean, it, it's extremely likely that we're going to find out and confirm that these are all who they say they are. Because they've been tested by American and, and Japanese forensic. But they have to be now tested by Russian scientists, that's the point. And they have to be approved by the church and the presidency. And I think that Putin is thinking about this is going to, that we're going to have to wait until the, the anniversary to find out what he's planning to do with these bodies or with these people. But, but perhaps they'll be buried tomorrow. But my point is that the Romanovs, you think of them as cursed dynasty, they were, they were one of the most successful dynasties of modern times. They're still relevant. What Putin's been done in Ukraine, in Syria, in Crimea, you'll see in the book, are channeling what the Tsars did, what Stalin did. And so, this is a story about an ordinary family where fathers killed their mother, tortured their sons to death, and <laughs> wives have their husbands killed and they take their thrones, and sons have their fathers steal their fathers' thrones and kill them. An ordinary family like all of ours. Um, but, but it's also a study of power, and it also tries to say what Russia was like. You can read it as a book about politics, or maybe you could just read it as an old-fashioned family song. Thank you very much. We sort of have a question about your source material. Can you talk about that for a minute? Because you have access to some previously inaccessible diaries and other documents, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, the book is based on an enormous amount of archival stuff. I mean, some published in the 19th century, some forgotten some well-known, some new, and um, the key thing with these books is, is, to, is, to, is to go back to the beginning and not to take sort of what other people have written, not to, take what, not to take what other books have repeated over and over again, but to judge everything yourself and to come up with a view about how it actually worked. And what I'm really interested in is how it worked, you know. So I, but to do that, you have to start with the sort of raw material, and then, um, and then just try and put it together. And so the, the, the things in the archives that haven't been used before, there's all sorts of things. I mean, the stuff about the murder of the Emperor Paul, the conspiracy that was in, in, the, that was in the Sorbonne had been forgotten, but would actually interviewed all the killers of this emperor, for example. Um, there are the amazingly sort of sexy love letters of Alexander II, uh, which are so shocking that they have some sort of sex acts, but I didn't know it had been invented in the 1870s. <laughs> I thought they'd only been invented in the last couple of years, but anyway. Um, 
And, and of course, there are the great correspondences of Catherine the Great and Potemkin and others. And of course, then you have to visit all the places and see where they lived. And it's, there's a lot to put together in these books. They are a nightmare to write, actually. But, um, but the fun bit is, uh, is, is traveling around the world talking about them and not having to write them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> time for another question or two? Yeah, let's, let's not have too many, because I know you've sat through okay, a very, very long talk. Just, just, just a couple, and then we can sign that. Uh, what sort of the chance you think, uh, say, under Alexander II, of Russia becoming constitutional democracy, if, say, Narodnia uh, Volnia hadn't killed him, or if, say, in 1907, Stolypin hadn't done the coup d'etat disbanding the uh, Second Duma, or was there any chance of that dynasty not ending in this blood and destruction? Yeah, I, I don't think it's... I, I, think, um, I think if they stuck to... I mean, that's great. This, is, this gentleman was asked the billion-dollar question. Was there, any, was there any way it could have ended differently? And to, to look at it in small print, um, to look at the detail, absolutely. I mean, for example, just to give you a few examples, in 19... In 1913 and 1912, Nicholas II completely destroyed the opposition, arrested everybody, sent them to Siberia, everyone was in exile. Lenin himself said, the revolution is hopeless, it's never going to happen in our lifetime. Um, so then there was the beginning, of, then there was 1914. Uh, it would have been very difficult for Nicholas II to, to uh, stay out of the war, but a great Tsar might have been able to do that. So that was one key moment. Throughout the war, uh, he made repeatedly worse and worse decisions that another ruler might not have made, which were not necessary. And another ruler would almost certainly have realized that there had to be a more responsible government. What I'm saying is that even in World War I, there were possibilities to reform, to change the destiny. I mean, the decisions he made were so catastrophic, you know, they were almost kind of, they were almost, they were almost kind of, um, like he was you know, longing to sort of destroy the monarchy. You know, when you look at the way he, he allowed his wife and Rasputin to run the government, I mean, and no one else would have done that. Um, it was just so insane. When you read her letters, to, to, if you're in the book, you'll just be gobsmacked at like how crazy they were, you know, and, and how much they depended on Rasputin, a person who had no political knowledge at all. When the revolution happened, as you know, it was completely unplanned. And the, the state discussed so it could easily have been put down if there had been more will there. Lenin was away. There, was no, there were no major Bolshevik. The only major Bolshevik in town was Molotov. So, so the revolution had no leadership. There were opportunities there. Um, if Lenin hadn't been sent back by the Kaiser in the sealed train, um, you know, sending him back was the most insane decision of the, of the Kaiser regime. But if they hadn't sent him back, if he hadn't got back in time, there wouldn't have been the coup. Um, if there hadn't been, uh, I mean, many of the Bolshevik leadership in, 19, in October were against the coup and tried to argue them out of it. Only Lenin, only Lenin's will made it happen. So there were, you know, nothing was inevitable. The Bolshevik, the, the family, the Romanov family weren't doomed until they fell into the hands of the Bolsheviks. You know, if they'd if they remained in the, in the in provisional government's hand, probably the children wouldn't have been killed. So there are a million ways that actually what happened wasn't inevitable, that it looks it now. But to answer your wider question, um, I think in 1881, Alexander II might have been able to do something. He might have, if he hadn't been assassinated. And that's one of those examples, like I was describing with Lenin, like with, say, Yitzhak Rabin in Israel with the peace process, where the life of one man, you know, every, everything depended on the life of one man. And just as it often has in Russian history, you know, without Stalin in 1932, I think the Bolshevik regime might have fallen. Without Peter the Great, um, you know, there might be a Swedish empire still around the world. You know, there, there are lots of, again and again, um, the, the force of individuals was essential and vital in this thing. And I think there were chances to reform <coughs> right up until the end. It would have been very difficult. It might have brought down the monarchy. The medicine might well have killed the patient. But I, I believe that nothing was inevitable, and it was, um, it, it was possible. But what was fatal was, as long as the Tsar believed absolutely rigidly and obstinately in the, in the ideology of sacred autocracy, then it was doomed, because that, that was already obsolete. Uh, and also, there was no one talented enough to actually fulfill the role. I mean, Nicholas II was extremely good at making, undermining his ministers 
um, behind, going behind their backs. He was very jealous of Stolipin, for example, who mentioned. Um, and he made sure that Stolipin was already being totally undermined by the time he was assassinated. Um, and yet, and yet Nicholas couldn't fulfill the role of autocrat himself, and he wouldn't let anyone else do it either. So that was a fatal situation. I think we should stop, because you've been incredibly patient. Sorry I talked so long, forgive me. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you.